Located on 225 acres in Garden City, Long Island, Nassau Community College, a member of the State University of New York System, has close to 20,000 students attend the school each year. The college mascot is Leo the Lion, and these are his stories of the school's absolute best and brightest who have graduated over the past 50 plus years. So let's catch up together as the Alumni Association of Nassau Community College proudly presents Lion Tales on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. Welcome to Lion Tales, powered by the Nassau Community College Foundation. My name is Aurora Workman. I am president of the Nassau Community College Alumni Association, and I'm here with my friend and co-host, Dr. Linda Nadian, a proud graduate, and together we'll share stories that will inspire, uplift, and often amuse you. Each week, Aurora and I will introduce you to alumni of Nassau Community College interested in sharing their experiences here while attending the college and the secrets to their success. On behalf of the Alumni Association, we want you to check out our website at www.ncc.edu slash alumni. It offers information on everything related to alumni life and from student life to fundraising. We really do have it all. Look for many new and exciting events on the Alumni Association's social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, and our web pages at ncc.edu slash alumni. If you, our listening audience, has any positive news you would like to share about alumni happenings, we would love to hear from you, so email us at ncc.edu slash alumni. Well, today's guest is Rosabelle Rocchio, a speech-language pathologist and audiologist. Oh, I need one of those. (laughs) (laughs) Who currently serves as a speech therapist in the Uniondale Public Schools. Rosabelle has an interesting background having completed coursework in languages, voice and diction, and is a fluent Spanish speaker. Welcome to Lion Tales, Rosabelle Rocchio, class of 2002. Good morning. Thank you so much. So tell us about your decision to attend (laughs) Nassau Community College. Um, I do have to say that it was not my first choice. I originally wanted to go away to college, but having very strict parents, that was out. So I uh, looked into Hunter College in the city and also Queens College, but decided that commuting to the city wasn't something I was ready for. And um, to be honest, my Queens college application never arrived. So, oh, see? Um, CUNY. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, at the last moment, really, Nassau was the school that I decided I would start off at. And it was honestly one of the best decisions. Yeah. And so what were some of your favorite courses that, that you had at Nassau Community College? Um, I have to say that I really got into psychology. And abnormal psychology was one of the best courses I took. And I definitely took more than, the I believe, the one course that they had said you know to mm-hmm. try I believe I took three or four psychology courses um, I also took public speaking but I I had to and I was very nervous to do that but so grateful that I did because it, it helped me tremendously and uh, voice and diction was my final course that I took um, during my final semester that counted as an English requirement mm-hmm. and the professor was a speech pathologist Oh, so give us a little bit about the backstory because you came to the United States in 1986. Yes. So tell us a little bit about coming as an immigrant child to the public school system in the United States. So, yes, I moved here in 1986 and I went right to Long Island to Valley Stream. (laughs) Uh, My aunt already lived in Valley Stream, so I think that's why I skipped over Queens and Brooklyn. And, right. Yeah, you know, <laughs> made it right here. My From Italy right, right to right Valley to Stream. Valley Stream. <laughs> um, went to, you know, started um, school when, in kindergarten, but I did move here when I was three years old. Did not attend preschool, but all my schooling was done in the United States, um, with the exception of in 1997 when I moved back to Italy for a short period. Oh. And, um, came back because this was where my sister and I wanted to be. So when you were here and you were enrolled in school, what grade was that? Um, I, I started right away, like in kindergarten. Oh, in kindergarten. Yes. Okay. Yes. But then when I did move back to Italy in 97, they said that my coursework was equivalent to 
a ninth grader, but I had already completed ninth grade, mm. so they put me in ninth grade in Italy. Oh, okay. After six months, I moved back and jumped into 10th grade again. <laughs> and so as a speech pathologist, and we talk about acquisition of language and acquiring language, and you're coming into America as a kindergartner, were, were you fluent in English already, or? I was not. I did not speak any um, English, um, and because I didn't go to preschool, I was home for that first year. Yeah. My sister started second grade, so I think I picked up a little bit from her, but my mom remembers that in kindergarten, within six months, I was speaking fluently. Wow. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, so, describe then your approach to speech-language pathology. Uh, do you think that that influenced you to, to choose that as a career? Um, I loved languages, so at that young age, I thought that I was going to go into something with languages, but what did influence me, I mean, it did help that I did receive speech for one year in kindergarten, just for my S sound, and I, I went to, like, reading, remedial reading, they called it at the time, um, and I did that for a while, but what really influenced me was, um, the professor that I had at NASA in the voice and diction course, and then my mom also um, had to go to speech therapy the same time that I was in that course for oh, okay. voice um, at Long Island Jewish, and she worked with a trilingual speech pathologist. Mm -hmm. My mom doesn't speak English, so um, I think those two things were, were major at the same time. That was oh. great. Now, what was some of your favorite? Do you know the names of that professor? <laughs> I am we were trying to really remember. <laughs> bad with names, but um, which is terrible. Um, no, I do not. But she really stood out because, you know, this was just an elective course mm -hmm. that I was taking. And I'd already taken public speaking and I took uh, the other English requirements. And my final semester, I said, oh, I'll give this a shot mm -hmm. to find out that she was a speech pathologist working here as like an adjunct professor. Mm -hmm. I always thought it was great that they had us take uh, public speaking, you know, yeah. and, and, and all of us didn't want it. Like, oh, I want to speak yeah. in front of people. I don't want people to speak in front of people. People are so fearful of you know? it. Yeah. But it's one of the great um, prerequisites that everyone gets to experience. And I think it was good for me. I mean, I, I wanted to sit in the sidelines and write, you know. Yeah. I definitely didn't <laughs> want to take public speaking, but then found out it was a prerequisite for my speech degree. Yeah. So another thing checked off my list. Right. And, and I mean, it was really good. I, I can't even remember my professor in that one yeah. in public speaking, but I always remember we had to write these shorts and then get up there and it was just like every day. <laughs> because yeah. it I, every day. Was it called? I know I had oral communication. That was the the title of the course in the course booklet. Mm -hmm. But I wonder. I I, I keep visualizing it as public speaking slash oral communication. I think it was both. Yes, and it I was a female professor. Now. She was relatively young, and I just remember. We were up at the board because there was actually chalkboards at the time. And then she would tell us something that we would speak about, maybe like an article that we had done or something. But right. that was great. You are listening to Lion Tales on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. I'm your host, Aurora Workman, along with Dr. Linda Nadian. And our guest today is Rosabelle Rocchio, speech pathologist, teacher, mother, and who has worked in the pub Uniondale Public Schools for the past 10 years. So you know we have that in common in this room. Yes. We are you strong, but I was raised in the Uniondale School District, okay, <laughs> raised in Uniondale, and um, I, and I'm glad that we have some really good teachers, and, and uh, with, especially with Linda here, we have some really good people coming to Uniondale School District. So how did you get to Uniondale School District? Well, I um, initially started in a preschool. Um, I worked there for almost five years, and during the time at that preschool, I went back to um, school to do my bilingual extension for speech because I'm a fluent Spanish speaker and also Italian, but I knew that Spanish would be something that would help me, you know, in my field. So um, after I completed my bilingual extension at Teachers College, I started looking to make a change and really wanted to get into the public school system. So I just applied and had my resume out there, and I really think that the bilingual extension helped me mm -hmm. get the job in in Uniondale. Oh, yeah, does. and we're, you know we're always seeking diverse candidates for these jobs, and and working with young children. What do you think? Like looking at the intervention piece of it, because we do talk about that a lot when 
we're screening children and most of the children that are classified are speech and language impaired. And how does that look for you now working in the elementary school? Are you seeing it more often than not? Or is it improving over time? What, what are you seeing as far as that? Um, over it? the time in the district now, um, it's my 10th school year. I, I want to say that number one, like the the preschool program that we have has helped yes. tremendously because yeah. kids are coming into school. It's a full day program. Um, we're screening them. Um, teachers are doing ongoing, you know, data collection and things like that. And I feel like um, that will help tremendously. Mm-hmm. Parent involvement has um, increased also. But I think the definitely the younger we get a child, services the better. Right. So even if a, a babysitter, a daycare center, anybody notices, um, the earlier we get early intervention services and then preschool services, and then by the time they're in school age, may, maybe they won't need the service as oh. much. And Right, that's true. You know, I think we see some of the reluctance from zero to three. Parents are a little bit in denial. They get very nervous about whether or not they would classify a child, but there's so many options to have early intervention prior to uh, the, you know, actually going into the preschool. But yeah, the preschool's been um, pretty incredible too. And right, early intervention does really help. I mean, I have, um, you know, with students with autism, one of the things that the parents here at NASA Community College was able to do at, from the children's greenhouse is get in touch with um, NASA County or if they found that they there was a delay in their students' development and growth, they had, um, I'm sorry, turning around, they had the EIP, you know, early intervention, and it really, really helps. And so anyone who's out there between zero and three, you know, you're, um, you're able to sit there and get services, and then the rest of the school time, they're able to get services. So do you deal with, a lo- uh, what are some of the misnomers that people don't know what speech pathologists do? Well, I mean, I think most people still think that it's just for articulation. Mm-hmm. And actually, in the schools, that's one of the things that I find, not that I do less of, but language is, mm-hmm. is really big, Um receptive language, expressive language, uh, pragmatic language. Um, It's a little bit of everything, but I I think that, you know, just having a child make that sound is is not all that that speech is. And is it true? Because they usually don't give services for just articulation. They don't in the school district. What is it called when they do? Some districts do. Um, is there like I forgot what the name? There's a term for it, like children that are that are in just for articulation purposes, and everything else is. Separate. I mean, I, I, I know that schools will do like um, um, I'm drawing a blank on this too. Just mm-hmm. like um, language, um, not maintenance, but uh, I'm, I'm honestly drawing a blank. <laughs> an <on> intervention. <laughs> it's an intervention that I yeah. need, but I, I do think <laughs> that schools should do that. Because that would be given at a young age, mm-hmm. maybe kindergarten, first grade, and then and then they're declassified. They're, and then they're declassified. That? If they were going in for articulation, would they be classified as um, you know? Would they have a speech, an IEP, and, and be classified for that? It's, Otherwise, you can't service them. Right. Well, in our district, yes, they have to have an IEP in order to service yes. them. But other districts do do like a that type of program where the child doesn't have an IEP but they're monitored, they're being mm-hmm. worked with and then they're able to um, see if if needed the IEP can be implemented. Right. right. And so and you know what about a child that has a lisp or they have uh, you know they're they're not able to pronunciate how um, are those categorized? Also for something like that oftentimes in the school district it is hard to get a service so yes. seeking out private um, speech therapy, you know, mm-hmm. covered by your insurance. You were listening to Lion Tales. Today's guest is Rosalba Rocchio, speech and language pathologist for the Uniondale Public Schools. Rosalba has served the district for the past 10 years and is proud of the work she is doing with the students in Uniondale. We are the boy band. Your tween made you see. We are the boy band. It's painful concert number three. We are the boy band. We're five and nine We are the boy band. Always singing on key. You love your kids enough to take them to see their favorite uh, band. Love them enough to make sure they're buckled up in the back seat. Show them you love them. 
keep them safe. Visit NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Welcome back to Lion Tales, powered by the Nassau Community College Foundation, on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm your host, Dr. Linda Nadian, along with Aurora Workman, and our guest today is Rosalba Rocchio, a speech and language pathologist working with elementary students in the Uniondale Public Schools. So tell us about what you're finding most interesting working with these young speech students. I just find children to be sponges. They take in all the information. They make tremendous growth from kindergarten to fifth grade. Sometimes I do work with the students from kindergarten all the way to fifth grade and then they move on to middle school. And um, I just, that's the biggest thing, just watching their development, whether it be their articulation, their language, their social skills improving. And even academically, because I do work closely with the teachers, I see how much growth they make academically as well. Yeah, what do you think? You know, it's interesting because I was having a conversation with uh, Dr. Dixon about finding candidates in special education generally overall. And we were speaking about the fact that although there have been changes, you know, through the state in terms of the standards and what we're looking for in candidates. But what do you think really has changed over the past 10 years? Like, what would you say coming in as a candidate now? What would you think your your viewpoint would be different than it was when you were hired 10 years ago? Um, I think our knowledge um, with the ELL population has definitely changed and, and our approaches that we use. Um, I know that um, a lot of students were being classified as speech and language impaired or learning disabled and it's it's been um because sometimes of the the language barrier right, but i yeah. really think that we're more informed in schools um doing more um in our buildings and working closely with the esl teachers the classroom teachers and everything to try to make sure that children are classified because they truly have a disability and mm. not yeah, a language we, difference. We've been we've been getting much better at the response to intervention and trying to make sure that we are progress monitoring a child so that when we do come to team or they do go to CSE Committee on Special Education that we are presenting a case that's legitimate. And I think the best part about it too is that you know, students get declassified. So I always tell parents, you know, don't be afraid of it because every year you'll have an annual review. So your child will either increase services or decrease the services. And mm. I, I think that is something really important to look at in terms of a more positive perspective when when working with, with uh, a child that may or may not be speech and language impaired. Definitely. Um, what are some of the uh, more challenging cases that you may have been working with um, we're seeing like food aversions and uh, we have seen some problematic uh, language disorders as well um, in the preschool I saw a lot more with the food aversions mm -hmm. the children were younger and I did push into the classroom for a lot of the services but um, th those can be very challenging we um, had a food group in the preschool mm -hmm. where the children that were selected would be taken out of the classroom and, and worked with speech therapists to just help them with their aversions, whether it was solid food, um, mushy food, um, different texture, yeah. different things that they um, had difficulty with. And I take, you know, what I learned there also with me in Uniondale because um, we want to give children opportunities to be surrounded by different foods. We want to introduce them to foods more than once. There was right. a rule there 10 times. Unless you try, once you try it 10 times, you can't say you don't like it. <laughs> and just tolerating food on your plate. Even now, we do holiday parties and mm -hmm. we see those children who just bring crackers to snack mm -hmm. every single day. You know, we want to expose them to more. Yeah, do you find that, we know the research shows that autistic children have a tendency, they don't like texture, uh, they don't, they, they like Candy harder, right. harder right. foods like bacon or potato right. chips. And just the repetitive. As opposed you know. to the, the, like yogurt. But then I do have a lot of students that, that are, you know, more partial to yogurt or pudding. Right, I think it just depends on the child. Um, some children are very sensory and then the different textures will affect them. And just um, from exposure too, I, I think, 
you know, you don't want them to have a meltdown on the floor, but, right. you know, we try to tell parents to keep exposing them to the different foods. Mm-hmm. They don't have to eat it. They could touch it. They could smell it. You know, just get exposed to it, and then eventually maybe it'll be something that they could incorporate into their food repertoire. Yeah. Yeah. So when they grow up to be like my teenagers and only want chicken, <laughs> it's not because I didn't try anything else. Okay. We tried everything <laughs> we else. We tried everything else, and we found out we narrowed it down. Chicken, I did, Monday we, through Friday. I, yeah, I do <laughs> find that you know the students are very, very picky, and we have a breakfast program and a lunch program, and, and we, they were saying, oh, more children should be eating the breakfast in the morning. I said, yeah, but they, they don't really they don't want, want it because it. if they're at Dunkin' Donuts, Donuts and they're getting a bacon, egg, and cheese. Yeah. They'd rather have that than some little donut from the lunchroom. And it, But I do find children to be much more picky, I think, because there are so many food choices yes. that they that, that they really do have so many choices that they yeah. don't even know what to do with I it. I could cook a whole meal on Sunday. <laughs> I spend the whole day cooking, and then my daughter's like, can I have Burger King? Yeah. <laughs> and I introduce them to all vegetables and all mm-hmm. fruits, and my 12-year-old is a little more picky now, where my 8-year-old will still eat like a, a <laughs> bowl of uh, string beans. <laughs> yes, I remember the good old days when my daughter used to eat radishes, and I was I oh. mean, just snacking on them. Let's snack on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I just made some vegetables. I'm like, oh, good. If, yeah, if, you find, if you try radishes 10 mm-hmm. times, you either love them or you hate them. <laughs> no, she would eat them and eat them. And then when she got to school, her whole diet changed. You know, I told my, I think I blame it on my niece because I didn't take my kids to fast food restaurants in the beginning of the, in the beginning of their life, like up until 10, you know. But then someone introduced them to the brown bag of McDonald's mm-hmm. and then became... Yeah, we were never allowed to have fast food very rarely. And also, you know, pizza or Chinese food was a luxury. That wasn't yes. something that you had because people cooked at home. Right. But, but it is it is interesting because it's sort of like the, the parenting philosophy mm-hmm. and the family life and what's changed over the years. So we're going to talk about uh, some of your goals for the future when we return. You are listening to Lion Tales on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Aurora Workman, along with Dr. Linda Nadian, and our guest today is Rosabelle Rocchio, a speech and language pathologist and therapist. So, we were as we were talking about um, the different foods that kids do, and that's a part of some of the um, things that you introduce students to in terms of uh, food aversions and at your own in our own children's lives, how we try to sit there and make it so that they are introduced into a lot of different foods and they end up loving McDonald's and Burger King (laughs) and pizza. So so everybody out there, it's nothing wrong with your kids. It's just what seems to happen all the time. So what are some of the other things that you do? What Outside of the speech pathology, what are some of the other things that you like to do? Well, I do love to take pictures. Um, I have a nice Canon camera that I don't use as often as I should because those cell phones are so great now. The real (laughs) camera. And the cell phones uh, can be uploaded instantly. But I do um, have a passion for photography. Uh, When I travel, I'm the one with the camera taking pictures of the scenery, taking candid pictures, even Mm -hmm. at a party. Afterwards, everyone's like, can you give us those pictures because you took <laughs> yeah. the most I don't even have to know the bride or the groom but I will take the pictures because right. I just find it beautiful. you know and I think everyone a lot of our alums and, and that come from here we always have this creative side and I yeah, know if Nestle absolutely. is building you know this creative side in all of us because we we do one thing but then we have this really artsy creative side whether it's a musician or a photographer or singers we all have a, a side gig yeah, something that we're doing <laughs> something that's like we really interesting <laughs> every every alum I think for every show there's always something that they that they do on the side that's in the arts and uh, we've, we found that to be a really inc- incredible pattern of uh, work from the alum at Nassau Community College you know when we had to look at um, descriptions I took pictures of my son's moods you know because there was mostly charts that didn't look like him so you know I would take when he was having a mood and I had all these pictures and so I was like who created this great chart you know <laughs> and I was just me snapping pictures of him and saying okay this is when you're mad and this is when you're sad and this is when you're happy see what you can do with <laughs> photography yeah, yeah you can do you know, everything with it and the picture captures the moment <laughs> 
Absolutely. And it does. And so he still has this chart, you know, and it's like, why do you have a chart of pictures of me? I said, because I catch it. I needed you to tell me how you were feeling. And so you pointed to the picture that told me more about what you were feeling. And so that's always a, a good thing to um, expand. So parents, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do out there for our listening audience who do feel that uh, their, their child may have a delay. And um, we don't want you to be afraid of that delay because there are so many services. And if they have services early enough, they will be successful throughout school. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, Rosabella Rocchio, it was so wonderful of you coming here to our studios. Uh, Do you miss us? I do. I have to say that um, just being on the campus today brought back a lot of memories. Of course, I couldn't remember the (laughs) building exactly, but some... uh, students uh, helped me. And you were class of 2002. I was class of 2002, yes. I started um, and uh, completed in two years. Yeah, and that's 18 years ago already, right? We're right going into, uh, you know, 2020 already. Yes. Yes. So how can our listeners contact you? Um, I can be reached by email. Um, My email um, is R-O-C-K-B-I-L-L-S-02 at gmail. I also have a work email, r r o c c h i o at uniondaleschools.org. And we hope that we don't end up overloading your inbox. Because, yeah, with, but with you are a context. really dynamic um, person and a dynamic uh, resource for our students, and we appreciate you being here at the WHPC. Yes. Ooh. Thank you so much. We want to thank you for being with us. My name is Dr. Linda Nadian, along with my fabulous friend, Aurora Workman. This show is a production of the Alumni Association. Visit ncc.edu slash WHPC for more information. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Android Podcasts, and Spreaker. Lion Tales is powered by the Nassau Community College Foundation. On the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC, we'll talk to you next week.